Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just to advise anybody that in the public gallery until this place actually closes at 2100 tonight, uh, they're welcome to use their mobile de devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are mute muted. They can connect to the assembly Wi-Fi and the details in accordance with the gallery rules. Just asking members to ensure that the electronic devices are switched to mute mode to ensure quality of sound recording. Just like to proceed through the agenda. Uh, first of all, we've had apologies from Melissa. Uh, and have we actually had a... Uh, I've actually had a, an apology. Pat? No, not from Andrew. Um, he told me he'd be here. Sure. Okay. So I'm expecting him to be here. Glad to have. Nice your Nice your so, no further apologies then? No, no chair. No, okay. Uh, can we go through the draft minutes of the proceedings? The draft minutes of the meeting of the 4th of March are at page 9. Our members are content that the draft minutes are an accurate record of proceedings. Okay. Okay. All in favour say aye. Aye. Disagree. We agree for the minutes to be published on the website. Yes. Okay. There are no matters arising. I remind members that the agenda item is being recorded by Hansard. Uh, before we start um, the formal proceedings today, I just wanted to point out, as uh, Jim Wells has already said, that there are some meetings that are going on today, particularly to do with uh, financial support packages, particularly for our business community and for our citizens. If we get any of that information that comes through to this committee during this period of committee, I will bring that in for a discussion if the members are content. Are we content? Agreed. Okay. And with that, we go to our oral evidence overview and priorities of NISRA. I may I welcome Siobhan, and due to the current circumstances, we are slightly more spread out than usual. And Jim is actually doing that for all the best reasons, but I'm rest assured his voice will carry and all the rest of it. But uh, before we start, I'd just like to say the clerk's briefing paper on NISRA is at page 16, and a briefing paper on the overview and priorities of NISRA are at page 17. And I would also like to inform members that the mem uh, NISRA officials will remain to answer questions on the next agenda item, which is the Census Order in Northern Ireland 2020. Gentlemen, our uh, committee, are we happy to um, uh, allow the officials following their opening statement on the Census Order? Are we content with that? Yeah. Agreed. Okay, Siobhan. Okay, so uh, very nice to be here, thank you very much. So I'm Siobhan Carey, I'm the Registrar General and the Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency. Uh, at NISRA we're all very passionate about what we do and I'd like to thank the committee for this opportunity to provide you with an overview, but most importantly to answer any questions that you might have for us. So um, I have some other colleagues here today. So uh, my senior team, Dr. Tracy Parr, who's uh, the Director of Analysis, Dr. David Marshall, Director of Census, and the Deputy Registrar General, Cathy Walker. So I understand they're sitting behind me, but um, I, I may ask uh, one of them to come forward uh, to answer any really specific details you've got that I might not be Thanks, on top of. Um, so uh, NISRA is an executive agency of the Department of Finance and incorporates the General Register Office. Uh, the GRO provides for the register of births, deaths, adoptions and gender recognition and administers the laws in relation to marriage and civil partnership. The Statistics and Research Agency is the principal source of official statistics and social research for Northern Ireland. We produce all of the main economic and social statistics as well as conducting the census of population and housing every 10 years. The next census is uh, on one year and three days' time, 21st of March 2021, subject to the legislation going through, um, but that is the date that is proposed. So the agency has uh, 486 permanent staff and a number of um, uh, additional staff, of which 388 are statisticians, and we're split more or less equally between delivering core services for the Department of Finance uh, from its headquarters in Colby House and uh, being outposted to over 30 separate public sector locations, uh, including all Northern Ireland departments and a range of non-departmental bodies, public bodies and local councils. So this puts analysts close to policy makers and decision makers. In addition, we employ around 300 household interviewers working across all of Northern Ireland. So our analysts provide government and citizens with external accountability through the publication of national and official statistics, information that they can trust, produced through a clear code of practice. 
They provide evidence to support policy development and decision making and to monitor and evaluate policy outcomes. They also support the programme for government through the development of indicators at the population level and then the collation of evidence on the underpinning report cards using the outcomes-based accountability model that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. So while we work across the civil service, if I could just focus on the work of the Department of Finance um, element, our main activities uh, on the statistics side are the production of statistics on the economy, labour market and society. That means that we collect data from businesses and from households, and the data that we collect serves the needs of departments here, but also it contributes to the production of statistics at a UK level. So the labour force survey that we do contributes to the UK um, statistics on the labour market. Last year we administered 11 different business services collecting 65,000 returns from businesses, so um, quite, a lot of, quite a lot of forms coming in. Over the past few years, we've moved most of our business surveys online, uh, and now 60% of the returns that we get are filed electronically. This is compared with 27% in 2016, so we've made a big push in terms of moving that data collection online. This reduces the burden on businesses, of which we are very mindful, and it makes our processing more efficient and cost-effective. Returns from households and businesses are the raw material for the statistics that we produce, and we were really grateful to the cooperation that we receive from businesses and from the general public. We also provide an end-to-end -end survey research uh, service of the general population. Our 300 interviewers approach some 45,000 households a year on 13 different surveys, seeking their cooperation on a wide range of topics covering labour market, health, well-being. These provide the data for 21 of the 49 PF programme for government indicators. Uh, in view of the evolution of COVID-19, uh, we are pausing fieldwork pending further advice, um, and I'm sure you'll understand why, why we're doing that. So the statistics that we produce are subject to regulation, uh, and that's done by the Office for Statistics Regulation, which is part of the UK Statistics Authority. The uh, Office of Statistics Regulation conducts assessments of the statistics produced for compliance with the Code of Practice under the themes of trust, quality and value, and these assessments and all the correspondence are published by the authority on their website. So this is a very exciting time for anyone involved in data and analysis. Data are now everywhere. Uh, the provision of public services via digital channels provides much ri richer possibilities for evidence-based decision-making and developing greater insight from data. Alongside this trend, in uh, 2018, the Digital Economy Act uh, 2017 came into effect, and that allows for the sharing of data for the production of statistics and research. While it is a permissive gateway in that it allows data to be shared, it does not compel departments to, to share, and this is for the production of statistics and research. The investment that we secured from the Economic and Social Research Council to support the use of linked administrative data is starting to make a difference. The Administrative Data Network is a partnership between NISRA and its academic partners, Queen's University and the Ulster University, and it's delivering new innovative analysis to support government decision making. Our first publication from the NISRA investment is on drug-related mortality, and that is going to be published next week. So last year, uh, we published our five-year corporate plan and that set out the things that we need to do to make the increased demands for effective data analytics support and the provision of timely and fit-for-purpose data to underpin evidence-based decision-making. It sets out our ambition for how we want to be, uh, our work to be increasingly relevant and the kind of workplace that we aspire to, that is innovative, collaborative and efficient a key part of that is about how we disseminate our analysis, making it more thematic, more relevant and more accessible. We publish statistics on a number of topics of interest to the public and government alike that attract considerable media uh, coverage. Recent examples was that we did a first publication on levels of loneliness in Northern Ireland and the number of deaths due to drugs and to alcohol. One of our most read publications, Northern Ireland in Profile, brings together key statistics into a single place so that the interconnections between statistics generated by the different departments and different sources are more visible. And I've brought some copies along today that I can leave with you for um, afterwards. 
But this publication was first created in 2018. It highlighted the pace at which the population was changing, uh, and particularly how it was ageing. In 2019, we were less than 10 years away from having more people aged over 65 than, the children, than children aged under 16, and that feels like a, it was a, one of those nuggets that really resonated with people. So this analysis has been updated, and you can see it's on our website and has got quite a lot of coverage. So the committee asked for our priorities. So before inviting questions, I would like to draw your attention to three specific areas. Firstly, as I've said, we're 368 days away from the census. Um, your next agenda item is on the census legislative scrutiny, and I'll come back to that in a minute. However, delivering a successful census is a top priority for us. The census is a huge logistical task, and it needs detailed planning. While it might seem a long time away, it is not something that we can pull together at short notice. It's a little bit like the Olympics in my view. We have to be ready for the exact date. There's no point in us being ready a week after somebody else won the gold medal. So um, that is very much how we focus on making sure that we're in our peak performance and ready for census day. Uh, secondly, uh, the programme for government, which as you know is being refreshed, uh, as a result of the new decade, new, agree new approach agreement. Um, and we have an important role in monitoring the population indicators in the current outcomes delivery plan. So the technical assessment panel is chaired by Tracy and determines the thre thresholds for change which indicate whether an indicator is improving, worsening or staying the same. So that is agreed in advance so you know how much of a movement you need to see to be able to um, say whether it is the same improving or worsening. Most of these indicators are based on NISRA surveys, such as the proportion of people experiencing crime or the employment and economic activity rates. We received recent investment to increase the sample sizes, to improve the precision of these estimates and to support more detailed analysis by age groups, protected characteristics and by lower levels of geography. So this funding has one more year to run, so that investment has really made a difference in being able to disaggregate the main indicators to lower levels of geography into smaller groups. Not all of the outcomes were able to identify suitable data sources for the indicators. Of the 49 indicators, there were 13 which initially required data development across departments. New sources have been developed for seven of those, and existing data have been repurposed or reported in a different way for a number of other indicators. A further two indicators are still in the, data, in the development stage and four measures have since been placed back on data development due to various emerging issues with data sources. As the new programme for government emerges, NISR is ready to support the development of any new population indicators as well as support policymakers in departments in terms of measuring uh, at performance level, whether in outcomes-based accountability parlance, anybody is better off as a result of their interventions. The third area I'd like to draw your attention to is that on the 13th of January, legislation came into effect that allowed for same-sex civil marriage and opposite-sex civil partnerships. The first ceremonies took place in the week beginning the 10th of February. The system changes required to implement this had to be carried out in a very limited time period. The other issue of note in recent times was a judgment to allow for marriages by humanist celebrants. This has been accommodated for civil marriages and civil partnerships, but will require legislation to fill, give full effect to the decision. So finally, and by way of context, one of the challenges we face is keeping pace with the art of the possible. As more administrative data becomes available, there's an opportunity to revisit some of the analysis we do. There is a vibrant tech community, particularly in Belfast area, so recruiting and retaining staff remains and presents us with a challenge. Um, and I'd just like to apologise in advance if, uh, given the, um, the events that are happening over the last few days, uh, whether, um, if we're not quite as fluent as we might have liked to be, um, we hope you'll bear with us. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Siobhan. Uh, just before opening up to the rest of the committee for a few questions, <coughs> there's a, a, something I'd like to say and just ask you a couple of questions. First of all, may I congratulate you because NISRA is one of the few areas of government and sources of information that is well respected and is quoted significantly in peer-reviewed publications. And indeed, one of the biggest problems we've had in Northern Ireland is access to good, high-value data. 
and I would like to commend Ezra for the work it's done because it has made it both for trying to understand changes in what's happening, but it's vital that area of data analytics and the depth and detail and the knowledge that you've been going to has been quite significant, and I would like you to take that Thank from you. me. Thanks. And I would also I imagine I would echo from the rest of the committee the great work that Ezra has done. So that was a good bit. <laughs> now there's something. Um, a couple of questions. First one: Which departments? if any, are not sharing data with you, and why. Um, the relationship between ESRC Queen's and the Ulster University and partnerships, who actually owns that data? And uh, particularly with the changes in data analytics and the rest of it, what have you been doing to look at sort of best practice across these islands? particularly to look at how data analytics is being used, because one of the biggest problems we've had with uh, uh, PFGs and also some outcomes-based government has been the measurement. And of course, one of the issues we have here, we're trying to measure 42-odd different things, whereas places like Scotland, they're measuring six. So one of the so what, what sort of discussions have we had with other areas to look at those sort of things coming forward? But Siobhan, yes, please. OK. Um, so which departments are not sharing data? I wouldn't say there are any departments that are not sharing. I suppose it's the speed at which um, they can share. So um, we have data from probably all of the departments that we've asked for. It may not flow at the speed that you'd want. So. Uh, it's a permissive gateway, so the data owner can share but doesn't have to share. And then there's lots of um, discussions around making sure that the legal gateways are right. So it's just that it's slow. And the Digital Economy Act is fairly new, so people are really finding their way with it. Um, so I don't think that it's an issue that people are refusing to share. Is there an MOU with timings from yourselves and other government departments? Or should there be an MOU that says you need to share it within a specified time? Um, I don't think that's necessarily helpful. I think most people are moving to share it as soon as they are confident that they can share it and that they believe it will get away. So this is all new legislation, so everybody's sort of trying it out for the first time. And I can I say that it's 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 across all of the jurisdictions that this is the issue. In fact. Here we have been much more successful than they have in Whitehall in making data available, and that's partly because um, people, you know, the network is smaller and there's more of an established level of trust, and there's more to be gained from uh, actually making the data available for analysis. So, in the reinvestment that came from the ESRC, uh, the three devolved nations were highlighted as being exemplars of how this could be done really well. Um, and the new investment was probably as much about refocusing how they can make that happen right across the base. So, um, so I don't think uh, departments are not sharing. It's just not every, you know when you want data, you want it now. Um, so uh, it's just that we probably get a bit impatient. Um, on the relationship about who owns the data, all data has an owner. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a clear. Uh, data controller, and then sometimes we are processors. Um, so that is, you know, each data set does have an owner that has to sign off that they are happy for that to, to be done. Uh, I'm not sure whether that was the intention of your question. No, it's just that it, a, particularly with some universities are putting a value on the IP of the, of the data that they have. And one of my concerns is some universities have been taking data that they've been bringing in from other areas and putting an own value on it, whereas a lot of that data has come through from government, which of course we've already paid for as taxpayers. Okay. So, so to be double charged for data yeah. that we already own is... So, I mean, the general principle is that absolutely um, most of the data, all of the data in government has been paid for by the taxpayer and therefore we don't, there's no charges for using it. Um, and uh, I mean, what data they have in the universities, I couldn't comment on, but certainly the approach within government is this is global public good and there should be made available. So the investment that we have from the SRC brings the data into our safe setting. We link it, if necessary, to any data for the particular research purposes. And then we have a secure setting that researchers, once they're approved um, and have gone through the training and the project has been approved and the information owners have signed off that they're happy for it, they come in and they use the data in our safe setting and all of the outputs of that are checked before um, anything uh, goes out. 
So in terms of monetizing the data, I mean, there are various methods that you can use for doing it. Um, we haven't tended to put a pound sign in front of it, but it's a, for our purposes, it's a global public good, and should, the more it's used, the more value it has. Okay, thank you, Arthur. And then about best practice and data analytics. Um, <clears throat> So, I mean, this is very much an emerging area. As more data moves online and more data becomes available. Um, uh, so we work really closely with um, the government statistical service and um, in terms of sharing best practice and sharing code where we have it or um, supporting each other. Uh, we also work very closely with the central statistics office. Um, some of our data that we publish comes from them. And we obviously have, uh, we do a joint publication on the census. Uh, in terms of sort of the best practice and analytics, this is moving so fast that it's really quite hard to keep up. The big investment that came into the system was from the Bean Review with the establishment of the Data Science Campus. Uh, and that is based at ONS, but it is very much a UK um, investment. And they have been really fantastic in helping us um, either through training or taking on projects on our behalf um, and advising us on how best to um, maximise the opportunity. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, oh. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I suppose there's two aspects to this. There's the census going forward and then there's the, the, the real important work that you do to actually right. populate, Is everyone going to? Yeah. populate the surveys and information for the Programme for Government piece, uh, which I think will prove more pivotal in the years to come uh, as we try and align a programme for government with a budget and vice versa and policies. But can I take you into the world of justice for one wee minute? So justice is an owner of one of the outcomes, I think it's seven of top of my head, I'm not sure. But within that, the important information is that is that there are five indicators that they use, a uh, percentage of the population who believe their cultural identity is respected by society the average time taken to complete criminal cases, the prevalence rate, the respect index, and the reoffending rates. Each one of those indicators have a different baseline. So when I'm looking at it, some are being recorded from 13-14, some by 2016, another 14-15. Is there a reason why the base rate, the baseline year changes? Uh, if you wouldn't mind, yes. No, you, you're okay oh, there. there. You stay where you are. <laughs> no, oh, no, 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 so, um, as you can imagine, we were starting off with scraps the first time around and we were learning how to do this work. And the work that we do is to look at each indicator in great detail along with the producing statistician um, and also the policy owners so they get to understand their indicators very well. Um, and as we were starting this, we realised that we had a few important things to do. First thing we had to do is make sure that those indicators were appropriate to be used in this way, so they have to be um, reliable and there's a checklist that we, that we go through. Secondly, we had to determine what a threshold for change looked like um, because, remember, we're not talking about targets here in the, in the OBA terminology. We're talking about getting better, or getting worse, or not changing. So that's kind of difficult. It sounds easy, but it's not. And we had to determine what, what, at what point are we going to say that there's been a change, either for the better or for the worse. And we had to do this for all the indicators. Now, because we were starting from a place where lots of different data sets were perhaps only collected every two years, or um, they uh, were of such a quality that you couldn't have used them for specific years, we had to make a judgment call as to what the baseline would be starting off. Now, my preference would have been that all of them would have been at the same baseline year, which was 2015-16. Also, of course, we've got some finance years and some calendar years. So you'll find, as you look through the indicators of 49, that the majority of them are actually 15-16. Yes. But there are some which, which we're not able to provide either reliable or 
any data for that year. And so that is the reason why there are so, some, um, some indicators have different baselines. Um, as part of the work that we're now going into in terms of developing the, um, the one-year PFG and then the longer-term one that you'll all know about, um, I'll be looking again at the indicators and I really do want now to get to a point where we have that uh, single base, baseline year moving forward when we get to the multi-year PFG. And will that baseline year, even if it's synchronised, would that change? And, and if it does change, what's the justification for changing and who would make that call? Okay, so it'll be, it'll be based on a technical um, assessment for change. So say, take for example, you mentioned justice specifically, there's, there's one of the indicators in justice and which has a different baseline from the other indicators. Um, and that is the time taken to, uh, de uh, uh, for cases to go through the criminal justice system. Um, and the reason that it has a different baseline is that at the time we looked at it, the data were not available for the subsequent year. Um, so now when we go back to look at it, we will uh, align that with the other indicators. Now it's a calendar year indicator, other indicators are mostly financial, so we still got that little bit of difference in terms of some of them will be, say, 2016, and some of them will be maybe even 2016, 17 this time around. So that work is yet to be done. Um, it is a very valid question that you ask. Um, but we had to start somewhere in terms of trying to pull all this stuff together. Um, what I can say, though, is that when you set a baseline year for indicators in terms of worsening or getting better, um, actually the, the, the year that you look at isn't that material, really. It is, it is really whether over that period of time things are getting better or worse um, and uh, the actual year that you choose is... So you're a statistician, but let me pull you into the murky world of politics. Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Chair. Uh, if, if I may allow this or may not. If, 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 you, if, you, if it was expedient for a government to change the base year to make the figures look better, yep. who makes that call? I love that question. Because that, that obviously is something that the panel that I, that I chair has come across very interestingly. <laughs> Some, I mentioned that we had statisticians in that group, but we also have the policy people. Very, very interesting. Some uh, policy colleagues absolutely see that point that you just make, and they say, Tracy, we're not interested in the baseline here. You do what you have to do. Um, there are the other uh, policy colleagues who would like to determine a baseline year based on what makes it look better in the future. Now, that, 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 that's just their initial kind of thinking. We talk it through, and we, they then get to an understanding. The, the decision is mine, okay. um, so uh, I think that that takes that politicisation of it out of... Good, the decision is yours, but would you not come under increased oh, yeah. pressure? Oh, I, I, I've been a statistician for 30 years. I think most days I come under pressure for right. policy makers to do certain things, yeah. Right, OK, that's very interesting. Another question around the indicators is that <clears throat> there seems to be different tolerances and thresholds as to whether it becomes no change, mm -hmm. negative yeah. change, positive change. Yeah, so you have, uh, for instance, you have the percentage of the population who believe their cultural identity is respected by society. Mm -hmm. The current state is no change. But, so, but 2017 records 66.2%. 2015, which is the base year, baseline year is 64. So there is a change, but yes. it's been recorded as mm -hmm. no change. Where is the tolerance level? That, that is also a very good question. So uh, there are 49 indicators, and they come from a mix of sources. Uh, 46 of them are from NIS resources. Out of our sources, they come from either administrative data sets or from surveys. If they come from administrative data sets, we have a call to make on the technical assessment panel as to what changes. Um, so say, for example, something like um, the uh, number of children um, attaining uh, the GCSEs, free school maids and non-free school maids are total. The, the Department of Education has to make a determination at which point they would say, well, if you jump from, I mean, the non uh, free school meals, uh, kids are doing very well. So if you jump from um, whatever it is, the 85s to the 86s, is, is that really a change? So they have determined, in conjunction with the panel, what we're going to accept as a change. That's the easy bit. Um, where the data come from a survey, we have a sampling error around the estimate, depending on the sample size. So um, some of our small surveys, uh, small sample sizes, will have larger estimates particularly as you get to the extreme of the distribution. So if you have 50-50, it's kind of like... Tracy, just to cut across, but that, that's all 
Obviously, when you're working with the ESRC and all the rest of it, that must be in accordance with standard norms and statistics. Oh, yes, it's a mathematical calculation. Okay. What we're doing is we're assuming that our surveys are <coughs> random samples, and when you have a random sample, there's a very easy calculation to do, um, which uh, determines what the error around the estimate is. As the estimates actually get further to the extremes, that error gets, gets higher. If you're interested particularly in justice, the um, victimisation rate, crime victimisation rate, is really, really low. And we have to have quite a large sample size to affect any change um, that, that we can pick up in that survey. Links into what Siobhan said, by investing in these surveys, we've increased the sample size, and that was the purpose of doing that. Um, so that each indicator is, is looked at uh, in, uh, in itself, and what survey it comes from. And that's why we wanted the investment, because when we looked particularly at the Labour Force survey, it is a really good source of many of these indicators. Um, and when you looked at it, the sample size just wasn't big enough to, uh, to use for some of the purposes we wanted to. And it's such an important survey. In the indicators, you've got the employment rates, you've got the employment rates by council, you've got the economic and activity rates. So we invested in that survey, which is now coming to fruition. And what we hope to find is that um, the, the, uh, the, the change that you need to have between the estimate um, and the baseline um, will be smaller as we move forward, so therefore it becomes um, more uh, uh, sensitive mm -hmm. to the, ch the change if we increase the survey. But that is why there is a different number for each of the indicators. The process behind it has been to look at the survey and to make that determination. Okay, one question then uh, on the census itself. There seems to be a massive change in, in our inner city populations and around multiple occupancy from say foreign nationals and people coming into work there seems to be an issue that I don't think the housing side of or the council have grappled with or got to got to that on the top of with regards to how many people are actually living in some households and it seems to be very hard for them to even monitor that and enforce it uh, around the multiple occupancy uh, measures how how will your staff be armed in order to get that information? There could be well a language barrier. Uh, people will see forms and not know what they're about. And how can you be assured that in every household there's not 12 people living in there instead of four? Okay, so I've got to ask David to come up, and we won't be arming them. That's um, they will be well armed, but <laughs> not with yes. not with arms. Um, yeah, um, the. the the census relies on a register of addresses, so we create a register of addresses. Colleagues in the office are making sure that register of addresses is as accurate as possible. We obviously gather information from the housing executive on their HMO list, but we, we go wider than that. We, we have a field, field force who go out on the ground to actually assess in each small area across <coughs> Northern Ireland, each enumeration district, have we all the addresses that we need? Are there addresses that weren't collected from government, you know, that people have, have, have created? In terms of foreign nationals, um, we make the census available um, in translation booklets on up to 17 languages. So there's essentially translated into 17 different languages. There's a, there's a, a leaflet that goes on with the census form itself that points people towards a call centre and that will also have a ability for people to, to, to talk through an interpreter. Um, the, this time round, the, the census will be made available um, primarily for people online, and we are recognising that we saw that in, in the earlier test that we done, that people are using online tools to translate the questionnaire as well, itself. If we don't get a response from an individual household, we obviously have people following up, going door to door, and they will have the ability to direct people or to supply translation materials, or in some instances, if they've got language skills themselves, to be able to support people in filling out the census. Um, so how do you know when people fill it online that it's actually the truth? And second of all, when you're physically in some, at somebody's front door and you look into a living room and you see ten bodies and six of them are only visiting, but really they're living there, how, how do you ascertain that information? How do you actually throw the truth out? Okay, so there, there's two different um, uh, elements in terms of quality assuring the figures. After the census is over, we run a second survey called a coverage survey, the census coverage survey. And basically, we go out to a, a, a sample of the houses that have been that fill, filled out the census, or indeed in an area where there may be people who didn't fill out a census form. And it's a bit like in agriculture when they ring fish, 
we we capture the same data from the house to make sure that somebody wasn't missing. <coughs> yes. And it's a sort of a similar type of a process, if you can imagine. So that's essentially to and that quality assures and make sure our estimates are, are, are as accurate as possible. We also have access to, as, as Siobhan was mentioning, the uh, administrative data from other systems. So, for example, we have access to administrative data, demographic data from the national insurance system, from the health system, from the school system, and we use that to sort of layer on top of the census to make sure that essentially we don't miss anybody, or if we do, it's not because we have a lack of trying. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Gemma? Thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I must say I'm actually very excited about the census, but <laughs> that's just me. Um, You're in good company. <laughs> my questions are around the um, multiple deprivation measures and the measurement of rural areas and deprivation in rural areas. Um, obviously, there are seven domains um, and income is one of them, but expenditure isn't. And I'm from a very rural area in Fermanagh. Um, so obviously, like, there's no public transport, so I have to have a car, and therefore I have to pay for insurance, I have to pay for fuel. Yeah. So my area of Fermanagh could be more deprived than somewhere in West Belfast, but because expenditure isn't taken into account, West Belfast is getting, I'm not just saying West Belfast, but you know, um, I think is it just maybe Castle Derg or somewhere is up there out of the rural areas for deprivation? And therefore, public um, public funding and things like that go towards go towards the areas that are more deprived. So I just think that there's a wee bit of an inequality. Um, so I just want you to comment on that, or is there a way of getting around that? Okay. So um, the, la the deprivation measures were done in 2010 and then updated again in 2017. Yeah. Um, in 2010, um, the data available were very different than the data we had in 2017. Mm -hmm. And we're very well aware of the fact that um, the, the data, because, because in rural areas the population is more dispersed yeah. and a lot of the um, domains depend on a, a, an amount of population, a density of population, um, that it could look, if you're just looking at the top 20% of the areas in 2010, as if there was no rural deprivation whatsoever. Um, so we actually um, had, were part of the committee's um, response to trying to improve that. Um, and we looked at new data sources then for 2017. Um, and uh, the two new sources that we had, which were really important to know about, were broadband access, mm -hmm. which is fine. But uh, we uh, had... Just to, just, just to put on record, I don't think any of us think broadband access is fine anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> as an indicator <laughs> of rural versus urban. Yeah. Um, Particularly rural. Yeah. That, well, that's the point. Mm -hmm. so yeah. We had it then to measure that. Um, and uh, then public transport access, and we did a lot of work around that. Um, in terms of the expenditure side, so the income domain doesn't, you're quite absolutely quite right. But what we have done is we've adjusted um, at council level for housing costs. So within, if you look at that income domain, you look a little bit more, uh, we don't have an expenditure part of the equation, yeah. but we have adjusted for differential housing costs so that there is some element of that of what you're referring to to try and be <coughs> more comparable. What we think is we, at the time, 2017, is we, di we did the best job we could with the data that were available then. Mm -hmm. um, so then when we're thinking about if we're commissioned to update it at some point in the future, <coughs> we'll reopen that debate. What we have found then is that the top 20% of um, areas on the 2017 measure do include rural areas now, and we think that that's what that, it's just happened because we've used better data this time around. Okay, thank you. It's better, but still not perfect. Yeah, work in progress. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was just that I think there's a recent error report, and it um, indicates that income is 9% lower in rural areas, so if all that sort of stuff could be taken into account. That, that is taken into account. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Jim? Um, it, there is a proposal that this will be the last census. Does that proposal apply to Northern Ireland? And if it does, what will we envisage happening in 10 years' time? Okay, so uh, there is a debate about whether this will be the last census. Um, it is pretty much the same debate that was took place 10 years ago. 
um, and obviously things have moved on a lot in, in the last 10 years. Um, the decision to take a census is a political one, um, so there are, uh, oh, Office for National Statistics does the census uh, for England and Wales, National Registers, National Records Scotland does it in Scotland, so, and NISRA does it uh, here. So there's a, the decision about whether it is the last census or not um, will be taken in each of the jurisdictions. Um, what, what are the things that might um, uh, work in its favour is much improved um, uh, administrative data uh, and being able to sort of do a synthetic census where you don't necessarily need to do traditional. Um, but David, do you want to add anything? Um, Some countries are beginning to move in the direction of of moving away from census, traditional census taking. Um, you could argue that the plan for, for, for Northern Ireland for 2021, we're moving towards a more online delivery of the census. So the, there's a move in that direction. Um, the, the United States changed, it's currently running a 2020 census, and it changed the way it ran the census back in 2010, where essentially it split the census into two pieces. One is essentially just the core, the census itself just captures the core, how many people and how many houses, and then they have a subsequent survey with administrative data that is a, is a lesser burden on the public, so they've split it into two. The French have decided to move towards a rolling census where they, they do part of the country at a time because it's obviously more cost effective. So there are different, different approaches. In the United Kingdom, obviously, we need to take a decision after the next census, and that obviously will, will link in with what happens in this census, but also in terms of what might happen in, in the, the Republic of Ireland as well, might influence the decision making because there's obviously decisions there about moving away from a census as well. We have to look at that too. But it would be a four country decision, there wouldn't be a case of one country deciding to go on its own. Um, well, the, the Northern Ireland uh, executive could decide to run a census in Northern Ireland if it so wished to do. The legislation allows that to happen. It would be it would be much more costly than, than running a 2021 census because we currently process the census in Northern Ireland alongside our colleagues in the Office for National Statistics. So if the, if the executive were to decide to do it, they would have to do that in the clear knowledge that it, would, it could, be, could be quite an expensive exercise. Uh, are you content that with more modern data gathering techniques that in fact you are getting enough data on a regular basis to replace the sentence the census that's an ongoing judgment i think when data is maturing um and certainly the census next year will give us a good indicator about how good it is now um but there will always be a judgment call as to whether what's good enough and, and balancing that out against the cost so, you know, I think if you look at how things have changed in the last 10 years, and if that accelerates, um, then you'd be making a decision maybe in five years' time about are you, how confident are you that what you can get is either good enough or whether you want to do uh, another, what they call traditional census, although it looks nothing really like um, what the census is used to look like. And what should we say if we didn't have one? So there... Good night. So the cost, the additional cost of conducting the census is uh, 35 million over the 10 years. Just for us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what? Um, but maybe if I could say a little bit about a question that often comes up, and maybe I'll preempt some of your other questions, is around the cost and value of having good data to make decisions. Um, and it's a question we often get, so uh, we're well rehearsed in um, how we respond to it. So people often look at the cost of statistics and think that's really expensive, but I like to think of official statistics as being the flip side of your public accounts um, coin. Uh, so while your annual accounts tell you literally what you spent the money on and where it went, the statistics should be telling you how that spending is changing the things that you want to influence and how you want to move the dial on and tell you and inform you about where you maybe need to be spending the money. Um, so I like to really think of it as not just um, how, how expensive are statistics, but actually the alternate question about how expensive would it be not to, to not have good statistics that you can trust. And that would mean making decisions in the absence of data. And if you take the cost of having statistics just on the economy, for example, that represents an absolutely minuscule proportion of the block grant um, here. Um, but the official statistics tell you 
whether what you're dealing with is a big issue or a small issue, it tells you where it is, it tells you the characteristics of the issues that you're trying to address and how you're doing in addressing them. And I mean, without decisions, it could mean that hospitals are built maybe where um, they're not most needed. And if I could give you a current example of um, what we've been working with uh, colleagues across the, N uh, the NICS in terms of uh, data to support COVID-19 planning, um, official statistics give you the numbers and, uh, of people who are over 70 who are living on their own. It puts, you, it puts them in households, which you would not be able to get from any other data source. So how many people in various districts are over 70 and living alone or over 70 and have underlying health conditions or are living in households where everybody in the household is either over 70 or over 65. So that sort of analysis that we've been doing over the last couple of days to try and um, support the decision making around where the vulnerable populations are, um, you wouldn't be able to get from any other source. So, I mean, I always say that without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm obviously going to be in the camp of where this is of real value um, uh, for helping people make the right decisions at the right time. Well, you've preempted my next oh, two questions, so <laughs> that's me. Okay. Well prepared for that one. Uh, other Jim? <clears throat> we get it all the time. <laughs> Chair, could you clarify? I thought we were having a separate session on the census. We are. Yeah. So it's not appropriate to ask census questions now? Uh, yeah. Well, the separate uh, it's on the one is specifically on the SL1. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. So if you have general questions about the census, now is the time to ask them. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'll not start with the census, but you said that um, the programme for government has been refreshed. Is being refreshed. I it's mean, being the, refreshed. in the uh, new decade, new approach, it says that there will be a new. Yeah, but you haven't been shown anything. Um, I have specifically haven't seen it, but I understand Tracy, there is discussions about. So the um, ODP that you're familiar with will be uh, TO leads on this, of course. This, this is not an Israel lead, um, and uh, they um, it, it will be a one year for next year, 2021. That will be um, in the next few weeks, is my understanding, um, available. Now then, after that, it will be uh, that, that's based on the priorities in the in the new decade new approach agreement. Um, and then from from there, we will be working with TEO to develop a multi-year uh, program for government from next April, April 21 onwards. Um, and it will then include uh, whatever indicators politicians require at that time, whatever the outcomes are after a level of engagement. But have you seen a revised? No. Oh, no. Could I ask you about marriage registers? Yes. Registrars. So as I understand, you're the registrar general. I am. Uh, the registrars who conduct civil marriages yes. are attached to our councils, is that right? They're employees of, our, of the councils. They're employees of the councils. So how does that fit in with your role? So Cathy. So Cathy is the deputy registrar general. Hi. So um, the registrars are all employed, as you said, by local councils, yes. um, and they employ registrars and deputy registrars. Yes. Um, what we do is that uh, we uh, put in place the legislation that they work to, but it's the council's um, responsibility to deliver registration to the public. Yes. Um, so we put in place the legislation and policy and guidance and uh, support them. Um, as far as costs and everything are concerned, um, we pay for everything to do with the registrars, um, even though they're not our employees, but they are there representing us as much as they are representing the council. So when you say you support them, as, you, as you've mentioned, same-sex marriage has come in. Indeed. Uh, for most registrars, that's not the situation when they applied for and secured the job. How do you support a registrar who says, in conscience, because of religious belief, I do not wish to be associated with or cannot perform a same-sex marriage? Okay. Well, um, first of all, they're, as I said, they're employee of the council, so um, they would have um, a job description and a contract with the council, not with us and GRO. 
But you said you support them. We do support them. We provide their IT, we provide their papers, we tell them what they can and can't do. <coughs> but you're going to tell me that this subject's not for you. This subject isn't for me. Um, the NIO have made it quite clear, um, both in their consultation paper and in other papers, that um, as a person working for a public authority, that there's no exemptions and that therefore they have to carry out same-sex marriage. So there's no conscience, right? Uh, they have no conscious rights. In other countries, that's not the case? I think there are a few countries where yes, that's different. Canada, South yes. Africa. Yeah, there are a couple, but the NIO have put in place exactly the same as it is in the rest of the UK. You think it's conscionable that somebody can be compelled in breach of their own religious beliefs and I mean, their own it's conscious not really area of function? Yeah. Yeah. I can't give you my personal opinion. Yeah. I can uh, only but, tell but you. Right, sorry, through the through the chair, sorry, Jim. We can't ask opinions. It's not a question of opinion. No, sorry. The question was, did you think it conscionable? No, that, those whom she supports. I, I will rule that yeah. that is a yeah. question of opinion. You're asking there, Jim. Well, well, chair, I do have to say this is the second time in this committee that any attempt to raise this issue has been oppressed, and this is a committee with oversight over marriage. Here's the Registrar General for marriage. And you're telling me I can't ask such a question? Really? Yes. Well, I think that just adds to the feeling of resentment that many registrars have in the manner in which they are being coerced. And yet, when someone seeks to raise it, it's ruled out of order. When you have sitting here, the Registrar General, with oversight for marriage. Your view has been noted and has been recorded. Thank you. Noted and ignored, I suspect. Any other further questions? I do have further questions. In terms of the um, census, uh, there's already been a question about how you test the veracity of answers given. Let me take a practical example. As I'm sure you're aware, there's a very political campaign to um, big up the interest in the Irish language and the Ulster Scots. And you're going to ask questions about proficiency in, I probably yourself. Sorry. Yeah, are you going to ask questions uh, <coughs> about, um, Dr. Marshall, about proficiency in, say, Irish? Now, if there is a political campaign to up the level of perceived interest in that, how do you verify? The answers. If someone says, oh yes, I'm proficient in Irish, or I'm proficient in Ulster Scots, whatever that is, how do you know whether it's right or wrong? So on the, the, 20, the proposed question for the 2021 census, we'll have two elements for both Irish and Ulster Scots. It will have the technical ability that a person uh, uh, states they have, whether they can understand Irish, whether they can speak, read, 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 speak, read or write. And then, if they can speak Irish or read Ulster Scots, they're then asked how often do they speak that language. That is fundamentally a question for the householder to answer themselves. Um, we go out after the census is carried out, and as I said to, to, to the, the, Mr. Frey, we run a, a, a coverage survey after the census. We also run a quality survey after the census where we go and we ask a sample of people did they answer the question? And did, did they understand the question? Did they answer the question accurately? So there is a subsequent follow-up survey that compares the results from the census with a second question asked of the same people. Just take that. You ask them on paper, can you speak Ulster Scots? Can you speak Irish? And they say, yes. How proficient are you? Very, et cetera, et cetera. Then you go out and they knock the door and you speak to them in English and ask them, can you speak Irish? Oh, yes. So um, the, we've asked the, the question on proficiency in Irish in the last three censuses. Yes, and uh, the, the figures from those three censuses broadly are very similar. So unless 
there was some sort of process where we, which we weren't aware of, that might create. We feel that essentially the figures are accurate and fit for purpose. We've asked it in social surveys, and that we get broadly the same answers when we ask these questions. But if, if they're self-professed answers, uh, which cannot be independently verified, then it is open to potential exaggeration or abuse. All surveys are open yes. to potential exaggeration yeah. or abuse. And they are self-reports. So A way of doing it, of course, would be say, if you're an Irish speaker, complete this survey in Irish. So that be a way of doing it. So the, the option to complete the census in, in 2021 online will be available for those mm -hmm. that want to speak to complete it in Irish Ulster Scots. Uh, and we will know the number of people who completed in that way. And will that be publicised? Yes, we'll publish that at that time. And will there be any look, any read across between those who profess proficiency in Irish and those who deploy Irish in completing the survey? We would, if, if the figures allow, we'll obviously make that analysis and we'll make it available. Mm -hmm. But it is, is a self-reported measure. Yes. So. Is your agency subject to FOI? Yes. Yes? Yes. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. And if we're content, we'll move on to the next uh, item on business, which is the Census Act, which is Jörg again, Sir Vaughan. Okay. Uh, I'd like to inform the members that Census Act in Northern Ireland 1969 makes provision for the taking from time to time of a census of the population and housing and for other eyes collecting statistical information. The census is the largest and most complex statistical exercise undertaken by government and traditionally occurs once every 10 years. The, we need to inform the members that the rule is subject to the draft affirmation resolution procedure for the Assembly. This is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1, as it is not possible to amend this once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. I would like to draw members' attention to the following papers. The Clerk's Briefing Paper at page 27. The SL1 Census Order Northern Ireland 2020 at page 29. The Statutory Rule and Explanatory Memorandum at pages 35 to 53 and NISRA's uh, Proposals Document 2019 at page 54. Siobhan. Okay, so Mr. Mayor, is the draft order before you form as part of the legislative process to enable the 2021 census to be conducted? And as you've said, it's the largest statistical exercise undertaken by government and the most important source of information on the size and nature of the Northern Ireland population. Um, government, commercial businesses, professional organisations and the voluntary sector all use census information on the number and characteristics of our people and households and I earlier gave you an example of how it's being used um, today. Uh, millions, indeed billions of pounds of uh, public funding and resources are allocated using census information and it also provides the only source of comparable statistics for small areas and small population groups so it's absolutely invaluable in that way. So the primary legislation used for taking census is the Census Act, uh, Northern Ireland 1969, and that Act describe, prescribes that the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, acting jointly, may by order direct a census of population shall be taken. It is then for me as Registrar General to undertake the census. In doing so, I am supervised by the Department of Finance. On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, David is responsible for managing and running the census, and he'll take you through the details of the order. Chair, um, the order today just uh, prescribes the date of the census, the area to be covered, the persons who, who have to who, who have to complete returns, and the person the persons who should be on those returns, you know, um, and the questions that should be answered. The order proposes that the next census will be held on the 21st of March 2021, mm -hmm. just, just, under, just over a year from now. The last census was held on the 27th of March 2011. The date that, we, that was chosen for the census was, was influenced by a variety of factors. It's a tradition that it's, it's carried out every 10 years. We want to maximise the number of people who are at their usual residence. We want to try and avoid any elections, if at all possible, because it creates confusion and difficulties for everybody. Um, and we want to ensure there's well, sufficient... Try. <laughs> yes, please, please, please do. Uh, and we want to ensure, obviously, daylight hours for uh, field staff who go out on the ground to, to support the people in undertaking the census. And obviously, with the end of March date, suits that very well. Mm -hmm. um, the, the end of March date aligns Northern Ireland with the rest of the United Kingdom. It accords with past practice and gives rise to quite significant efficiencies for ourselves. Uh, we 
uh, have joint publicity and we use the systems and services, as I noted earlier, in, with our colleagues in the Office for National Statistics. So we, a lot of the systems and services underpin the Northern Ireland Census are run through with our colleagues in ONS. Um, a census is also planned for 2021 in the Republic of Ireland. It's planned for a slightly later date, for Sunday the 18th of April. Um, the second aspect of the order details who should be included and who's responsible, critically who's responsible for, for filling out the, the census as well. Every individual who is resident in Northern Ireland must be included. Um, we also will collect a subset of information on visitors to Northern Ireland, those people who are here temporarily. And we, we do that to ensure that we don't miss anybody, um, because obviously we want to make sure that everybody's counted. Uh, every household, and we use this phrase communal establishment, nursing home, student halls, those sorts of things, will receive a census questionnaire. We'll make special arrangements for those people who are from the travelling community or those people who are sleeping rough to make sure we count them. Uh, in terms of responsibilities, it's the householder's responsibility to fill out the form for the house uh, to ensure that, this, that, that, that it's returned and completed accurately. In the communal establishment, it's the manager's responsibility to complete the form or the person in charge. Um, and they also are required to make sure that there's an individual return for every member of that common establishment for every individual who lives there. The third aspect of the order is relates to the information on, on the return itself, you know, what, what questions we ask. We've had extensive consultation on this over the last number of years. That began in 2014 with a formal paper noting plans for a census, and that was supported by the executive at that time. We've had two further public consultations in 2015 and 2018, and five public meetings, and members of the Assembly were invited to those meetings and took part. Um, we had responses from a variety of people and organisations, some of whom were very familiar with the census and some less so, uh, and had then had discussions with the topic experts around what questions to ask. Um, government partner departments, obviously, as uh, key users, were also were, were also informed as were academic, business, statutory sectors, voluntary sectors, and we met with our own statutory statistics advisory committee, who, who also helped. Um, following this work, the, the Registrar General published her proposals on the census last year, in April last year, and the copy of that document is, was, was 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 provided to the to the committee, I believe. Um, the size and scale of the census requires us to undertake a dry run. So last. Uh, last autumn, um, we ran a dry run of the census, census called a census rehearsal in Fermanagh. I'm proud of that because I'm from Fermanagh. Um, and in and there's specific issues about Fermanagh, which if you want to ask about later on, and in Belfast and in Craigavon as well. Um, uh, such activities um, helped us to ensure that the census was, was essentially good to go. We wanted to deliver consistent data. And David, did you run that online? as well to test out the IT? Absolutely, and that was one of the reasons, obviously, we're, we're for, 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 uh, um, providing mobile phones to our field staff, and obviously for Manor, West Fermanagh, we wanted to make sure that roaming facilities with the border, that that will work very well, and that worked, we're, we're, actually the software for the, the field staff was remarkably, worked remarkably well, and it was written, would you believe, although it's a UK system by a Belfast-based company. <coughs> um, remarkable. Belfast being in the UK, that's not so surprising. They're, 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 so they're, I did say it had a big tech sector. So. <laughs> so they're providing the software not only for Northern Ireland, but also for, for Great, Britain, Great Britain as well. So it's quite a remarkable achievement. Uh, David, just on that one, and, and I'll, the big question will come further on, but one of the issues, obviously, and I raised it, and I wasn't joking, I said we have real problems for broadband in rural areas yeah. and the rest of Northern Ireland, and also with data as well. So one of the things that we need to be sure about okay. before we say this is we are content that we will be able to gain the necessary information from the census. Well, we, we, there, we have specific arrangements. I'm going to actually maybe mention that as we come yeah, to sorry, sorry, sorry um, for um, The particulars are in the draft order. Most of those have been included in previous censuses, so the particulars would be the questions, your name, your, your sex, your, what, you know, all the, the questions. There's around 42 individual questions, which is the same number as the, as the last census. And this, the consultation suggested a number of new topics, but we have also left some out. So the new topics... Uh, there's a new household question on renewable energy systems, um, whether the household has solar panels, a wind turbine, those sorts of things. There's a new adult question on apprenticeships completed, um, and there's finally a new adult question on sexual orientation. The sexual orientation question in the census um, will have no penalty for non-response. We amended the Census Act last year through Westminster 
that it meant, meant that the, there's a, the people are not required to fill that, 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 that question out. There's a prefer not to say tick box for those who don't want to answer it. And we believe that's the that is tested very well in testing. In doing so, as I said, we want to manage the burden. So the questions in 2021 are no more in length than they were in 2011. Um, and we also have left some questions out from, 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 from 2011 where there's other sources. So for example, um, voluntary work, there's other sources on voluntary work we're able not to include it for 20, 20, 2011. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, um, before I get into the specifics of broadband and, and, and how we deliver the census, I want to reassure, reassure the committee that we treat this in the utmost confidence. Um, it's, you know, I, 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 we will never provide census information to anyone outside, albeit in only anonymized or aggregate ways for those for statistical information. We manage the conduct of the census and we have a track record to do that, providing, making sure we have data security and confidentiality. That's the highest, that's the highest priority for me, to be frank. Um, in doing so, we obviously work with our colleagues in, in, in England and Wales in the Office for National Statistics, but we also work through the National Cyber Security Centre. Um, in terms of the online piece, um, uh, about 20%, just under 20% of the population are going to receive up front a paper questionnaire. So about 80% are going to receive the opportunity to go online. 20% are going to get a paper questionnaire. The people who are going to get a paper questionnaire are typically either people who live, we believe, in elderly households or people who live in areas of the country where the broadband facilities or the, the online facilities are not, are not as good as they would be elsewhere. So partition the country into two parts. Those people who get an online facility only, in, 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 as a first, they will obviously be able to ring up and get a paper questionnaire if they want. And if a few weeks or a few days after Census Day we don't get a return from them, we're going to send them a paper questionnaire anyway. So that's just to, to, to reassure. Um, in terms of the, the, the operational aspects and the legislation, we, we will start to appoint field staff and create enumeration districts and specify the questionnaire in detail in regulations that will come before the committee after this order um, uh, makes legislative consent process. So that's my <coughs> okay. Thank you very much, Jerry. Sean? Yeah, um, was it in the whole county, David? Did it in Pamana or just take one part of it? So the, the area, Sean, would be from Belik right through down to Belcou over Derragonley, over in that sort of west Fermanagh area. But there's about 4,000 households in total. Do you fill it in? I didn't fill it in. No. <laughs> no, it was did. voluntary. The, the rehearsal, <laughs> rehearsal's not compulsory. The census itself. Uh, in terms of what you learned from that, uh, David, and, and that's the one that I was going to ask you from the earlier, was access to broadband, and that's one of the big difficulties of us having, yeah. you know, being rural representatives. What percentage was going to do it on broadband, or in, on terms on lane? Uh, coming back from that field study or dry run or whatever you want to call it. So in the Fermanagh part of the, in, in the rehearsal in total, just over two thirds of people, uh, two thirds of households, sorry, uh, completed the, the, the rehearsal online. Mm -hmm. um, uh, about, now that differed from different parts of the, different parts, so in Belfast it was slightly more online, but in Fermanagh it was slightly, slightly less, but it was still over 50% um, who completed it online in, in, in Fermanagh. What, what was the return? Now people would have known this was a dry run. Yes, and obviously they did. wouldn't have taken it this seriously as what's going to happen next year. So therefore you wouldn't have got the same return that you would get in a proper census. No, we would expect. I mean, it was, it was made clear it was a it was a voluntary exercise, so the, the you know uh, people weren't required to take part, and, and some and some didn't. It wasn't. It was testing our systems and services, uh, as well as the questions themselves. So we want to make sure that the online system worked, that the paper questionnaires could, people could fill out accurately, that the that the the, the field staff processes with the the the, the, yeah. the app they all work quite well. So all those things were part of the key to the process. In, see, in terms of going out when it's going out, what avenues would you use in terms of you know making the public alert that this is coming? You know, and it's something that possibly we as representatives could play a role in, and local councillors and and the local council. So. The awareness campaign, would you run that a month or so before, or TV ads or whatever? Um, so we have a, a quite a significant publicity campaign, um, and we, we tested some of that in, in the rehearsal, not to the same scale. Um, 
So we ran uh, some ads in the in the local newspapers. We ran an ad in the in the in some of the Fermanagh newspapers, some of the newspapers in Craigavon and in South Belfast. Social media is a big thing for 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 yeah, for, 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 for 2021. Um, one of the things, would you believe, that was quite quite powerful for us in the rehearsal was uh, some of the police the police. The police social media facilities, they were able to put out that essentially census enumerators and census forms were in these areas. And people, quite a lot of people follow the police on social media, and that helped as well. So we have a whole raft of advertising through social media, uh, papers, uh, television, um, and a raft of other exercises as well, as well as a community engagement exercise through local communities too. Just a final question, Chair. In the end of the day, what is the accurate return on any census? Is it 90%, 95, 100? You mean, when you say accurate, you mean the optimal? Yeah. Uh, it'd like everybody to complete the census. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you just have a figure? Do you just have a figure of what in around 98 or 95? Well, our figure's 100. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I mean, one of the things we really want to make sure is that um, while you might get, let's just say you got 90, 98% yeah. overall, what you'd really want to make sure is that that was right across the board, that there wasn't yeah. you know, 100% yeah. in one area and much lower in another. Yeah. So the metrics on that about how it's going and the volumes coming in are absolutely critical and they're tailoring the messages and the resourcing to making sure that we get uh, not everybody in one place and gaps in the other. Um, yeah. no, that's, thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Pat. It's just small. I was wondering over the last 10 years from the last census, have you had any breaches of your security data? No. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. That's it. Jim. Uh, yeah, paragraph 2.5 of your document. Of the order. Sorry, the, the order or the proposals? The, the, the proposal. Proposals. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Sorry. What page, Jim? Um, page, 70. page 70 of the pack. Um, it's talking about the address check you carried out in two seven, 2017. Uh, third sentence. An on-the-ground address check was carried out across 16,000 addresses in September 17 to test the existing address register. An analysis of the results indicated that the address register at that point did not meet the required quality measures for accuracy or coverage, and consequently, NISRA planned to carry out an address check in advance of the census rehearsal in the 2021 census. So, when you when you test road tested it in 2017, uh, what does it mean that it didn't meet the required quality standards? I mean. So we obviously create a register of addresses in the office um, before the census runs, and then the field staff uh, in 2017 and 2019, um, and indeed in 2011, they have a they have an area on the ground to deal with. They got a list of their addresses and they went in and identified: is this list tally with what is, is, is what reality is? And in 2011, figure work suggested that essentially there was. 4% of houses on the register that shouldn't have been there, demolished, you know, those sort of things are, they, they, they shouldn't have been, and there was 3% of addresses missing. Now, in 2017, I haven't got the figures in front of me, but it was less than that. Mm. So it was less than the 4 and 3, but it was still sufficiently large for us to run it again in the rehearsal, and we did an address check again in the rehearsal. So is that anything to do with people claiming to live somewhere that they don't? No, it's 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 typically around. You know, we have to take the register for the census, probably about six to eight months before census day. Yeah. Um, so you can imagine houses that would be being built through that process. We then find them find them uh, on the ground. You will also get um, addresses where they're demolished or they're they're dilapidated, and you know we didn't expect to receive a return. And again, they're on the register, and we, we, we shouldn't have been there in the first place. That's the sort of thing. It's more about the physical changes in the environment. And what about uh, the idea of people claiming they live at an address, and in fact it's not their address at all? 
so this would be people who live with parents or don't don't live with parents, those sorts of things. Um, well, obviously, we, we as, I, as I said earlier on, we do this check afterwards where we, we resurvey the houses. Door or maybe door. a son or a daughter who's working abroad, but in fact, the parents put them down as living there when they're not. So there are, there are a few things we do. One, we do get an occasional duplicate on the census, specifically uh, children of uh, divorced parents. You could see them being recorded twice. Mm. If that happens, we, we, we make sure that the census database removes one of those occurrences. So if, they're, if a person is duplicated on the census, we can remove them. And what if somebody has an address in Donegal and an address in Permana? Okay, well, there, there are rules about filling it in, and those rules are on the form and on the, on the online system. Um, you're meant to only record on the census if this is where you spend the majority of your time. So it's assigned to, it's down to those rules. And have you any way of checking that? Um, specifically between ourselves and the Republic of Ireland, or, yes. or more generally. Yes. Um, we we don't share data with anybody from with anybody else, so we don't check it in that way. We do have information about previous residents, and we identify whether somebody said they previously lived in the Republic of Ireland. We do some just checking to understand whether the figures feel accurate or they're inaccurate. Um, but we don't record second residents or any of those sort of things in the Northern Ireland census. Just to, just to follow on a bit from Jim, when you're looking at the data sets when you're looking at residencies and the rest of it, do you compare that against LPS and also compare that against the Ordnance Survey yeah. and map them out? Yeah. And what degree, have you got an idea of what degree of statistical inconsistency there is in those data sets? So there's, there's, I mean, we work hand in glove with our colleagues in LPS and indeed with the Ordnance Survey. We use their maps to help us in terms of delivery of the census. I mean, y you would expect me to say that our data is, is as good as we make it. Our colleagues in LPS are continually trying to, to make sure their data is as accurate, and we, 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 we do our best to make sure that we cover across, but um, we cannot share census data with our colleagues in LPS. It's a statutory framework, it's private, and right. we cannot share across to them. Because I think as elected representatives, we've all had the problems with the electoral commission where we front up and somebody comes to our office and say, I don't appear on anybody's um, data set. You know, I'm trying to register to vote. I can't do it because my address doesn't appear or I'm not available or whatever it happens to be. And whereas it's a relatively small number, it's probably statistically quite important. Yeah. I just wondered if you had any sort of... In when you've been doing your test runs, particularly in Fermanagh or something like that? What we do is we do share with Ordnance Survey and indeed with LPS and indeed with the Electoral Office aggregate statistics. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we're able to say after the last census that these certain areas were the areas when I talked about those, those accuracy issues. They're, they're obviously not the same across all of Northern Ireland. So our colleagues in the Ordnance Survey were able to use that information to go out and resurvey those areas to try and get the register as, as accurate as possible. Okay. okay. Tim, are we content? Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you. So, a team at this stage asked the committee that we have um, considered the Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the Census Order of Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Are we so agreed? Agreed. Agreed? agreed. Yeah. Chair, uh, having, having done that, it would be appropriate to write to the committee for the Executive Office. To inform them that this committee is content and the committee for the executive office will then consider the draft order with their view to agreeing that the order is made. Are we content? Agreed. 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 Here we go. Okay. Uh, team, the small the SL1 rate small business has been removed. It's not being forwarded, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Yep. Okay. Go through that. Uh, the next one then is SL1 on the whole of government accounts designation of bodies order in Northern Ireland 2020. Uh, the anticipated date that the rule will come into operation is the 31st of May 2020. The rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedure. Advise the members that this committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1, as it's not possible to amend this once the rule has been made and led in the assembly business office. Inform the members the following papers are related to this SL1. Clark's briefing paper on the SL1, the whole of government accounts designating of bodies order in Northern Ireland 2020 at page 117. And the whole of government accounts designation of bodies order in Northern Ireland 2020, page 118. Draw your attention to the purpose of the draft order, which is to enable the Department of Finance to request information from those departments and bodies designated in the schedule to the order, and to pass the information provided to HM Treasury for use in the preparation of whole government accounts. 
This is an ongoing UK-wide exercise which Northern Ireland has been part of since 2004 and 2005. Members, are we content? All those agree, say aye. 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 Any disagree? Passed. Members agree, therefore, that the Committee has considered Department of Finance proposal for subordinate legislation, the whole of Government Accounts, Designation of Bodies, Order, Northern Ireland, 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications and of the pros legislation at this stage. We move on to the next SL1, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland, 2020. The anticipated date the order will come into operation is the 1st of April, 2020. The rule is subject to the ne negative resolution assembly procedure. This is our opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1, as it's not possible to amend this once the rule has been made out and led in the Assembly Business Office. The following papers are related to this SL1. The Clark's Briefing Paper, the SL1, Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2020, page 129, and the Public Service Pension Revaluation Order, Northern Ireland 2020, page 131. The proposed statutory rule uh, specifies the annual percentage change in prices and earnings for the purpose of revaluation of pensions benefits accrued by active members in career average revaluated earnings, care, public service pension schemes. May I seek agreement from the members? All those members of here say aye. aye. Any against? <coughs> members have agreed that we have there, which we have. The committee has considered Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the public service pensions. Revaluation Order Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Draw members' attention to the fact that the Department is instructed to submit proposals for statutory rules to the Assembly Committee for pre introductory consultation in the form of the SL1. This particular SL1 received for consideration on the 6th of March 2020. Uh, before the Committee had the opportunity to consider the proposal, the statutory rule was then led in the business office on the 9th of March. I would like to seek your agreement to ask the Department to outline the reasons why the Committee was not afforded the time, given that it is routine legislation which is updated annually, and also ask the, de the Department why the Committee was not notified earlier that there may be a delay in bringing forward this legislation, bearing in mind that this was fairly routine. All those in favour say aye. 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 Any against? Uh, aye. Agreed. Sorry, Chair, just going back to item 7, there was a, a paper table that laid notice in relation to the, the rates which uh, maybe the, should be introduced to, to the committee at this stage. Right. And also there's a suggested uh, line of question at page 5 of table papers that members might want to seek agree. Uh, you might want to seek and if we have a look at page 5 on table papers. Sorry, table papers. Table papers. Tim, have we all seen this letter here, uh, dated the 18th of March 2020, com committee briefing from the private office? Uh, by the, the committee is aware policy and non-domestic rates for 2021 is changing rapidly as a result of external circumstances. It says the officials are happy to answer written questions from the committee and or reschedule attendance at the committee. Uh, members, would we like to, uh, would we like to uh, accept written, like them to accept written questions from the committee? Or do we want them to reschedule? I would say, in view of the current circumstances, yeah, I'm yeah. quite content with written questions. Yeah. Yeah. Or they get on seeing what they're doing. Correct. Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's much more. It's important that this done as well. Uh, if we take from your uh, uh, suggested questions on page five of the table of questions, if we have a look at that, which is para twelve, if those are the questions we would wish to ask, could we submit? We take that as the basis for submitting those to the uh, uh, department. All those in favour say aye. Okay. You've had a chance to read it. I'll watch Paul. Uh, I'm, just looking page, I'm just looking at page four to see what uh, there's a, a whole series of questions there, but maybe they were just for support uh, for a more formal. Um, I, I think this is a, lot of, a, a very uh, quick moving feast, and I think we need to keep on top of it and keep the pressure on so that decisions are made timely. Yeah. Uh, so, again, we could agree. To a written brief here and ask certain questions, but they could be obsolete by tomorrow type scenario. But I think we have to keep pressing on. Well, that's our role. We're scrutinising. Uh, yep. So, so yeah, that's what for us, and I would like to do that. Yep. If we're, if we're content? Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Yes. Okay. Uh, we move on to the next, the written briefing, Chancellor's Budget 2020 21. 
Uh, draw attention to the following papers on the matter. Note from the Department with a brief summary of the Chancellor of Exchequer's 2021 budget and a press release from the Ministry of Finance, page 135138. A committee at this stage, and bearing in mind the question on the issue Jim raised earlier, we haven't had any other information that's come through, but we'll be all aware that this is a rapidly moving feast. And also from the Chancellor's statement yesterday, there are other implications that will come through from Northern Ireland that we we'll need to consider, but we have insufficient information at this moment to go. So that, with that proviso, we'll go through this as well. Uh, table to page 7 is the Clerk's briefing, which provides the position of the main estimates and spring supplementary estimates for 2019-20 and the budget for 2021. Page 8 is a written statement from the Minister of Finance on the 1920 public expenditure further allocations, which is sent to the Speaker for approval under urgent procedure. Response from the Department informing the Committee of precise timing of the budget process with the intention that the Finance Minister will announce the Northern Ireland Budget 2021 on the 30th of March 2020, page 139. Are we moving the announcement? That's the announcing the Northern Ireland Budget. Isn't the date of the Northern Ireland Budget being changed? So, we're at sort of bullet point. Yeah, the, uh, the, the budget will still be led on the 30th of March, okay. but following this uh, letter today, uh, they'll not be May. seeking a uh, to debate it until we commence on the 4th of May. Okay, it's still going to be laid on the 30th of March and laid yes, on the 4th of May. And that will provide an opportunity for committee scrutiny. Okay, are we content with the timing team? Yeah, so so if I, if, uh, and I'm sort of lost my place here, but yeah. we're, we're on we're on item uh, 10, 10. Bullet point 4. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Maybe uh, the Department of Finance's role with regards to scrutiny is, is Agenda 11, is that right? If I'm <coughs> uh, just, just where we we outline, Jim, just where we outline to the chair, or processes and writing to the other committees. Um, so, if you like, we're having a post-executive budget exercise. This is this point, isn't it? This is agenda item ten. Yep. If I'm right. Uh, so, even if we could outline, could you outline exactly what what process is there? So we get the budget laid on. The 30th, 30th of March. And then we have this re retrospective period of of up to about six weeks, I think. Uh, and nope. then there's a, a step there's a step change process right through for all the committees. Normally a draft budget would be laid in a possibly sub September, would go out to consultation and, and then a, a, a sort of final draft budget would come to committee in <coughs> December. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, that would then be scrutinised by the, the by committees. This draft budget, uh, the legislation requires to, to be, it to be led by the end of the financial year. So there will then be a, a week, there's a clerk's memo in, in, in papers to the clerks of other statutory committees to suggest they take evidence on the 22nd of February and then the committee positions are agreed the following week on the, tw sorry, the 22nd, 22nd of April. April. 22nd the committee positions April. are then agreed the following week on the 29th of April. And then, a, a possibly according to this letter, a, a debate and a vote a week commencing the fourth of May. That then gives the opportunity for a committee scrutiny and for a, the chairs of the committees to provide meaningful contributions to the debate on the fourth of May. Okay. Just, just, sorry, just on your letter, Jim, a draft letter for you to send out to other committee clerks. The last page there. I think it's the second paragraph down. There could be a typo there with regards to date. It says week commencing 25th of April. That should read 27th. Is that 10.1? Uh, that should read 27th. That's on page 143. Right, 143. Uh, it just says meetings during week commencing 25th of April. I think that should be... Week after. 27th. I think Monday's the 27th. Monday's the 27th. So that we know... <coughs> Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, it says 27th in the in the summary as well. Sean? No, that budget timeline has been outlined in a paper to us last week, isn't that right? Uh, yeah. Well, well, last last week or there was, there was uh, 
there was no indication of there being a, a budget debate on we yeah. commencing the 4th of May, so this is... That, that's the change that we've had indication of there being yeah. the Yeah, and this now provides committees the opportunity to scrutinise the budget in, adv in advance of right. the Assembly agreeing the budget. And I think from discussions we've had previously with timelines and when we're supposed to do that actually does, I know it's compressed, but it does give us time. Yeah, yeah. So I, as the chair looking around me, I'm content. Yeah. Yeah. That's all we have. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> and page 141, a draft, map, a draft memo from the clerk to the clerk's statutory committees informing the indicative timing as which we just discussed that. I advise the members clerk's memo, a clerk's memo asking committees to hold oral evidence sessions or evidence sessions as they determine. I think that's we need to be clear on that one. On the 22nd and 23rd, and to agree their committee positions the following week so as to ensure that the statutory committee scrutiny complies with the agreed time frame for budget scrutiny. Are we content? Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And seek agreement the clerk's memo to be circulated to the clerks of all statutory committees. I think we've agreed that, Jim. Happy with that? If we move on to written briefing, Department for Finance Role and RHA tariffs is set out in the Regional Rates and Energy No. 2 Act. I draw attention to the written response on the Department of Finance Roles and RHI tariffs as set out in the Regional Rates and Energy No. 2 Act on page 145. Comments, team? Yeah, can I add, I always want to ask for this. I am not happy with what we have got. We have got a very detailed timeline of events. I am actually amused that throughout these pages, I don't think the NIO is, is mentioned at all. Uh, surely the Secretary of State was the sponsoring sponsor of the bill, and there doesn't seem to be any engagement or interaction with the NIO. I also asked for minutes. I don't see that we have received any minutes, if I'm wrong. I had a quick look at this last night and shuffled through it all. I, I don't see any minutes that discussed and recorded the here and now when the meetings were taking place uh, and that's not what I had asked for and again what annoys me is we're going back now wasting more time asking the department to produce more paper more information and we should have had it in the first place uh, so it's a burden on everybody's time uh, but this is this is post uh, inquiry this is post uh, Sensational news stories. There should be there should be minutes available, and if this committee of finance ask for those minutes, we should receive them. So I would ask: Are there minutes? Where are the minutes? If there are no minutes, why are there no minutes? And let's see them. Um, again, what we have is a very detailed timeline, explanation of what took place, but that's not exactly what I asked for. And again, where was the interaction with the NIO? Because it's not shadow is, shadow as they are, shadow as they, as they are, they're still not mentioned in this document, and it would be nice to hear exactly what interaction they had on behalf of their secretary of state. The chair, just on this document, um, I must say I find it very frustrating to read because the paragraphs are jumbled up. Yep. If we look at page one four nine. It goes paragraphs 21, 22, 23, 24, 16, 17, 18, 25, 26, 23, 27, 19, 20, 21. Now, are they just wrongly numbered? Or are they out of sequence? Or are they just being, cut and, such a they just being cut and pasted to put yeah, in? How has such a document been sent to us? <coughs> so I would like the document tidied up to start with, as well as what Paul said. Any other thoughts? I, I, I do think that we need to come up. Uh, we know I'm going to take the time to read through this, so I may well come back next week with more questions, Chair. But I just wanted to put it on record today that I'm not happy with the, the information that we have received. Um, through uh, from the committee, just to get your views, <coughs> I don't think um, I don't think this is an acceptable piece of staff work to be sent to a committee anyhow. I don't think the process that they haven't answered the question that is put as much information in it there is no that doesn't answer any of the specifics that we asked for and I speaking as for this committee I don't think that we should accept that and we should go back to them and say we want a considered and detailed response to our actual question um, and we understand the pressures that there are but this is important that we get this right and bearing in mind we've just had the RHI report coming out 
it should be indicative of all departments should be answering their questions appropriately to the, the committee. And Chair, why it's so urgent is that the tariffs need to be renewed in April, 1st of April. That's weeks away. Mm -hmm. Two weeks. Uh, so this is urgent. This really is urgent um, as to what we're going to do. Are we content to? Not content with the letter, but are we content for a response? Agreed. Agreed. Chair, given the committee considers this urgent, I could request a response in time for meeting papers on Friday or at yes. least to be tabled the following week. Tabled for that, or, or an explanation why it can't be done. Uh, moving on, the written briefing for the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, written briefing for the Northern Ireland Rights Commission on page 156. Any comments? Moving on to chairperson's business, uh, drawing a mention attention to a response received from the permanent secretary in relation to the first time briefing at page 166. Um, team, to say the least, I'm not particularly happy with that response. Uh, the issue about things being redacted and first day briefs, having been informed here that the entire committee was going to be told mm. that we were going to see the full first day brief, to now being said that they want to discuss things offline again with the uh, chair and the deputy chair before we get to this point. Um, I am minded to ask your opinion, but my view is, my view hasn't changed. We asked for the question, the committee asked for the question. I expect the committee to be given the answer. If they want it in a closed session, that's fine. But I don't, I don't believe that is acceptable. Uh, do I have your agreement on that, team? Agreed. 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 Right. Okay. Correspondence. Uh, ask members to consider the following sets of correspondence. The department has provided four sets of previous minutes from the Construction Industry Forum of Northern Ireland. And the focus of the recent construction industry of Northern Ireland meetings from pages 169, 169 to page 312. Uh, any members would like to make a comment? Any members read it? Uh, why was it uh, chair, in the pa our papers that was one done? Hmm? Why was it in our papers? It was mostly to do with procurement. It's, it's, a response to the, it's a response to the question we asked. Um, without, um, without prejudice, as our legal profession would say, and bearing in mind, uh, having worked in government before, that reminds me of somebody who's decided that uh, they'll put everything in it just to swamp the system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ask again. Uh, I think one of the things we might ask through the day low is a degree of respect to the committee when we're asking for these information so bits of pertinent information could be supplied. Are we agreed? Yep. Agreed. Uh, if we move on to um, the department has provided details of the number of accounting officers still requiring page uh, page three hundred and fourteen, which is two. Are we content? Yeah, I suppose that it begs the question: When will they complete their training, uh, Chair? Uh, there's two outstanding. Uh, there are two accounting officers who have not received their training. So when will that commence, and when will it be completed? Would we be content to go back to the department and ask that question, committee? I think we're agreed on that. Uh, members to discuss the, the department's response to the correspondence received by the committee from Hospitality Ulster. Um, we would like to forward the response of Hospitality of, uh, Ulster for information and consider the correspondence further when Hospitality Ulster provides oral evidence to the committee on the 29th of April. Uh, I wonder if the members are content to note the remaining items that correspondence, including the information request to the department, tabled at page table eight. Content. Yeah. If we move on to the forward and updated forward work program on page three three four, I draw members' attention to a letter from the from the speaker tabled at page twenty one to all committee chairpersons of COVID nineteen and assembly business. Obviously, this is an on moving situation, and we treat this with all seriousness as we do. But as my view as the committee chair is that it's vitally important that we maintain the fun functions of government and scrutiny as long as possible and we need to be able to ensure that by whatever means we manage to do that. But I would like to uh, put on record my admiration for the hard work that's being put by sort of not only the health professionals but everybody else across government in Northern Ireland in these trying circumstances. Great. Yeah, very much agree. Uh, could I just take 
one small point of clarification. Uh, the Speaker's letter talks about restricting access to Parliament buildings. I take it that doesn't impinge on witnesses coming to committees? No, I don't think so. No, no it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's, it specifically I, doesn't. I think the, in another place at the moment, they're discussing uh, the uh, Commission are looking at specifically people who are coming in and coming out. But I, my understanding is it does not refer to witnesses, and nor should I believe it should refer to witnesses. Um, I would just say, um, on that clear for me, um, it's good that I, like obviously this will be broadcast when we have hopefully our committee hearings can continue as in the next few strange months as uninterrupted as, as possible. But they will be interrupted um, when we have um, witnesses. So last week we had the guys from we had a. Schmoyer's board of four people from that's completely inappropriate to four people sitting that close to another. We should have at max two people as set, set, set out today. That's, that's why they are. That's, that's why we did today, man. We did that today, yeah. okay. Did you actually tell people not to show up? No, no, no. no. two sitting further back. And right, they, okay. They alternated. Because that's what you get for not turning up. I'll be asking to form squares and exactly to the manor born, Jim, I think. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, ladies, levity, please. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, moving on, sort of, thank you for that comment. Uh, four members of the Business Committee meeting yesterday, the TO informed the Speaker that a legislative, con that an legislative, legislative consent motion on an emergency coronavirus bill may be tabled this week for debate on the Assembly next week, potentially on Tuesday. On that basis, I would ask you to be, make yourselves available, uh, make committees to be aware that the degree if an LCM is tabled on a bill that contains provision relating to your respective departments that we should, the committee should seek to have an additional meeting to be briefed on these provisions prior to the debate taking place. I think that's appropriate. Agreed? Yeah. Uh, four members of page 338 of the, the department has informed the committee it will engage on the various strands of work being taken forward under the review of financial process, but it would ask it to be deferred until after the budget is announced. I think I would be content with that. Are we content with that? Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Informed members of page 339, the department has informed the committee that while the minister will write to the committee with an additional brief in the RHI inquiry report, he will want to provide a more substantive briefing once the report is giving a comprehensive analysis at the earliest practical opportunity. I think I'd be content to note that. Yeah. Content? Yeah. Uh, mind members of the, the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill has passed its second stage and is referred to the committee from today. I advise members. Uh, Table papers at page 22 is a clerk's paper suggesting reading evidence on the bill. I'm sorry, folks. I'm at the window. I'm trying to get a question. Just sorry, John. No, that's fine. Okay. No. Uh, uh, where were we? ask, I want to ask members who were content to request written evidence from the groups and individuals suggested and to commission assembly research to identify appropriate witnesses that the committee may wish to call in relation to the bill. The clauses of the bill to which they should be called to give evidence and to which committee evidence should be given in relation to each clause and if we can identify and compare the provisions for special advisors that are in place in the legislature of Scotland, Wales, the UK government and the Irish government. And obviously with the current COVID crisis you may wish to ask the committee to agree to only schedule essential evidence sessions for the time being and we may wish to review the forward work programme to consider which oral evidence sessions they may consider to be essential. Are we agreed? Chair, can I, could I suggest that we should include the Public Appointments Commissioner yes. on the list? Happy with that. And um, my recollection from the past is that the committee advertises the fact that it's conducting a hearing into a bill. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. 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 Invites yeah. anyone who wants. To yeah. Wants. Yeah. Presumably that will be taken notice. notice. Yeah. 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 Do, do public notice. Can I also ask that, that whilst we have the technology in this building, that, that if there may be some presentations that, or evidence that may have to be given, that we can maybe do it through video, tele, yeah, video, video teleconference. Especially if we're talking about our jurisdictions. Yeah. Um, on so this is a, a, another question on the how we set it in COVID nineteen disruption. Is it possible to give consideration to having a committee? Uh, and this has been discussed already. Apologies. Um, I'm going to leave early as well as arriving late today um, to have a member be here electronically as it were now that's not ideal but we're not in ideal times in terms of having someone an app, like one of these tablets with someone visible via Skype and able to email the clerk for example with questions in real time 
I think I will take that as the chair and the vice chair. We'll take that through the clerk to the other committees and also to the speaker about how we're doing this. There is discussions ongoing at the yeah, moment, yeah. and but we need to understand if it's going by Skype and how the process is going to work, and we need to get a, a approval for that. But that question is something of, I think is germane, and we've begun to. It probably isn't realistic to have the talking head there, like the, but you know. There, there should be a, a mechanism by which a member can be virtually present, even if they're emailing questions which are asked either through the chair or, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or via a, you know, a process. Chairs, I understand that that is being looked at. Okay, good. Should have more. There, there are issues, obviously, and it's it's a fast-moving situation, but I, I'll find out and update members at next week's meeting, okay. not before. Okay. Chair, could I just take it back to the bill? Um, we're seeking, we're writing out to these various bodies. Uh, is there a time frame we're putting in that, or what's the norm? Well, normally, I think the this the committee has to have an agreed extension by the thirteenth of May. Yes. Uh, I think writing out to them uh, with Easter recess, it would be time enough to seek responses by the twenty second, twenty ninth of of April at this stage. But I would imagine, given the the circumstances that members would want to have flexibility in mm -hmm. possibly looking for quite a long extension with view yeah. to, to finishing earlier. So uh, members may, may want to think about that. Uh, and also fitting evidence sessions in that, that, that could be difficult. So we we'll give consideration to that and come, um, come back to members on it and uh, see what length of an extension members want. Yes, but there's no need to come back to us on what date you're putting in the letters. Oh, abs absolutely not. Yeah, those yeah. letters can get out. Four weeks or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, next uh, uh, item of business, page 16, is the Minister's letter on the transparency, accountability and functions of the Executive. Any comment? Uh, next is table page 22 is correspondence and a press release from the Minister of Finance regarding... So just going back, Chair, uh, do members want to take a look at the forward work programme now and agree it and see if there's any oral evidence sessions in it that they may wish to defer? I think not at this stage because things are evolving, Jim. So we'll, we'll, I'll, ask, um, I'll ask out of committee for the committee to look at the, um, the forward work programme and have a consideration about things that they may, sh may wish to delay, but as things are moving on. Uh, so, and it was just showed that the departmental solicitor's office are scheduled for next week, so the members are content to keep yeah. them in. Yeah. Chair, can I just go back to a point that Matthew and the committee here have raised? And, uh, you know, it's live just at the moment there with the mic, and I think that we will be be looked at or we're, we're leaders, so we need to be following, I mean, the strict lines is two metres apart, and it's all right to come into the room and say we have two chairs or two back, but if people are looking at this, we need to follow a strict set of guidelines. I don't, I don't want to go on just about this, but is there a way or is there a health or safety or is there a policy where we can have this, that it is, that, that we know it is right? I mean, we come in that door. Uh, we walk past each other, we just sit down. To me, it's a lot of bad practice, folks. I don't want, to, you know, we need to be serious if, 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 if we're going to show true leadership here what's expected of us. And I do want to be working here. I want to come in. And I state that I would put myself as one uh, that is at risk simply just through underlying health issues. But I want to be here. And it's a time for leadership for us all. So I think we need to look at this for our next meeting. And I hear what uh, Mr. Hollister said about people coming in or presenting orally or not to, to the committee here. It's needed, no doubt, but we need to look at new ways of doing this. And when this is all over, there will be new ways, because new ways, are, they're formulating all the time. Thanks. Thanks for that, Pat. Uh, I'll take that and sort of with the chair and the deputy chair. We'll take that with the committee liaison's group to, to look at how. Because <coughs> obviously, it would have to be on a coordination basis of all the committees. I understand. Thing, because there's absolutely no point in us doing something yes. separate to whatever it happens to be. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Also, also on that, I'll uh, refer to the committee and uh, uh, the CAMS office. Yeah. 
Uh, it's just a point of chair, and it's the last one. I'm sorry, but I mean, the likes of maybe there's two members here from, from ourselves, myself and Matthew, where, where only one would need to attend. But in order to look at the, that you have the right quorum at that, at that meeting, can they be doubled up in such a way? Or can, is there an agreement working through that, maybe on TMO? Or are they looking at that at the moment? Or? I, that is, again, that's a question I'll, we'll take away and uh, to get an answer to that. But there's a reason why we've already reduced the size of the committees down yeah. considerably. And there's a reason why we are the number that we are. And the basis for that is to improve full scrutiny of business. But you, you're here not as a party representative. You're here as an MLA for the scrutiny. And it's vitally important that we continue yeah, in the process of government. Path. But that's all understood. And thank mm. you for making that point. Um, Sort of correspondence and press release from the Minister of Finance regarding the NICS disciplinary process for cases arising from renewable heat incentive inquiry on page 22. Any comment? Uh, page 27 is a press release from the Minister of Finance in relation to the RHI recommendations. Any comments? Page 28 from the Clerk of the Committee on Procedures seeking the Committee's views on the review of legislative consent motions. Ask the members that are content for the committee staff to review the Committee for Finance and Personnel consideration of LCMs during the 2011-16 mandate and report back to the committee for the meeting on the 1st of April. Do you put that? Read. Uh, team, thank you very much indeed. And the next meeting is on the 25th, uh, next Wednesday at 2 o'clock in room 29. However, if we have to bring in uh, an L emergency LCN for any reasons, we might have to convene the committee earlier than that. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I can be heard, um, it may be we'll want to, if we do have an emergency, we can look at the package. It's probably the most important document we do. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, Dave. Just adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thank you.